At Home with Beethoven. That title might well require a question mark after it. How does one feel at home with one of the greatest creative artists in history? Taken in chronological sequence, Beethoven's works trace and define a spiritual and technical evolution that is perhaps unparalleled in the arts. In order to feel more at home with his music, we must reject any stereotype notion of what Beethoven is and simply try to follow him as observantly as possible in all the manifestations of his protean creative spirit. Further, it is necessary to know as many works of Beethoven as possible in order to fully appreciate and understand the singularity of individual works. It is universally agreed that Beethoven stands alone in his power to create monumental and perfectly integrated musical structures from the smallest motives. Yet insight into his motivic structure is only a small part of what must be recognized. One must try to understand the spirit motivating each work, as well as the relationships between the composer's intentions and the musical processes that take place within it. With this in mind, one will discover that Beethoven's motivic process varies remarkably from work to work, in accordance with its particular nature and style. Long line trajectory is central to the formal character of Beethoven's large-scale works, and it is present from the first of his mature published piano sonatas. Behind this long line trajectory is the generating force of a motivic process so skillful that its workings are often all but hidden from us, although its unifying power is constantly present and felt. The performer must be aware of the details of this process, but in no academic sense as mere techniques. On the contrary, they should be apprehended for their function in the phrase-building process for it is only through an appreciation of the large-scale tensions and releases established in this process that the performer may arrive at the power to express Beethoven's true grandeur. It would be possible to trace Beethoven's evolution very successfully through an examination of his symphonies, quartets, or concertos. Yet it is particularly gratifying to approach this through his piano sonatas, for it was to the piano that Beethoven entrusted some of his most intimate and daring thoughts. I have chosen four sonatas which I feel are landmarks in the development of Beethoven's style. Assuming now that we are at home in another sense, seated in front of the stereo, and with the score of Beethoven's piano sonatas in hand, let's take a look at a few of the sonatas to find out what we can about their changing styles and content. The Sonata in D Major, Opus 10, is a work of Beethoven's early maturity, representing his complete mastery of the Viennese classical style. Among the sonatas, it is one of the earliest revelations of that dynamism within a long line trajectory along with organic integrity of form, which characterizes Beethoven's large-scale works. Its infectious optimism, energy, and humor, notwithstanding the tragic slow movement, and its marvelous workmanship make it a piece of special importance and appeal. With the opening of the sonata in D major, Opus 10, one can hear immediately that it is to be a piece with a wide-flung trajectory, a trajectory that sets the ear in motion and bids it follow with fascination and exhilaration. This is no neat formula which says, here is a motive and here is its answer, and this is what we will work with. It is a bold fling into space, a rocket ignited. Looking more closely at this wonderful opening, we see that it begins with the tetrachord, the upper tetrachord of the scale of D major. This simple four-note figure acts as the fuse which sends the rocket into flight. The rocket reaches a high A, the dominant, and poises there before bursting into four parts to begin its descent from the peak of its parabola.
three of these parts, we must notice, are simply the tetrachord again, falling sequentially in three-part harmony. The fourth voice is an incisive dominant tonic command to guide them on their way down. As if somehow irritated by this fall after the opening suggestion, the full orchestra now bursts out with its forte, the tetrachord in rushing broken sixths, and the dominant tonic command translated to octaves in the low bass. Thus satisfied and newly energized by the outburst, the rocket now rises higher, with doubled note values. How practical of Beethoven to accomplish this with alternating hands. And its trajectory now carries it into a new area of space. Its last four notes predict the rhythm of the new tune to come after the fermata. The new tune in B minor whistles like a carefree schoolboy, even swaggering a bit. There's something slightly familiar in its swinging gait. Could it be the suggestion of the descending tetrachord which begins the second half of the phrase? Notice that it is dissonant to the harmony, even in its echo at the phrase end. So far, we've had the tetrachord about a dozen times. Is this little group of notes what makes the movement tick? In a way it is, but that is only because Beethoven the dramatist uses this actor with such cogency and wit. It is like a hidden force that gives the action a great overall unity. The next two four-bar phrases find the tetrachord in the same relative position. For the first time now, the tetrachord turns itself upside down and is extended into a hexachord, six tones. The G sharp is an auxiliary to the A, so it doesn't count. The excitement begins to mount now with the hexachord rising in imitation of itself, like little streamers running up to fasten on their highest notes. These highest notes form the elements of a sequence of chords which thicken by accretion as a result of the hexachords running up to join them. This is a marvelous instance of Beethoven's way of creating a dynamic change of texture for climactic effect. Even more astonishing is the realization that the soprano notes of this chord sequence spell out the original tetrachord in augmentation. From this great augmentation, the line descends in a swirl, a great four-octave sweep of scales. Reaching its highest note with a chromatic struggle, it plunges an octave and a half to its cadence in the dominant. This completes the first grand trajectory already suggested by the opening bars. After such intense and purposeful activity, a little play is natural. The second subject begins with our tetrachord, now the lower half of the dominant scale, but the very same pitches. It's a very playful figure. Its gestures are mercurial, not flowing as before. When the minor key repetition in this subject is broken off suddenly, 
we seem to be warned that something is about to happen. Yet it continues nonchalantly for four more bars, with the tetrachord bubbling underneath a new syncopated tune on top. You will have noticed that the middle voice of that phrase is a semitone couplet. What follows is an example of Beethoven's phrase-building skill at its finest. The couplet is allowed to grow gradually into the larger unit, the tetrachord, in inversion. In the process, it has modulated downward in whole steps with two bar harmonic units to the remote key of C major. Now it swings upward again in three steps with four bar harmonic units and with the tetrachord mirroring itself in inversion. Notice how it is goaded forward by the sforzandi on the pickup note. That is Beethoven's little whip and its authority cannot be denied. The third step is a surprise, the Neapolitan of the dominant, a foil for the blazing out again into the dominant, breaking the four-bar unit pattern. Once that happens, the harmonic rhythm quickens to the end of the phrase in a bar pattern of one, 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 three quarters, one half, and one quarter. And of course, all those fragmentary repetitions of the tetrachord are made whole again in the long octave scale descending against this compelling rhythmic diminution. After hearing this 23 bar phrase as one large unit, I suggest that the student play only the soprano line from the beginning of the phrase. He will discover a tremendous variety of rhythmic units, both melodic and harmonic, strategically deployed to compel us forward. This is Beethoven's will embodied in his rhythm. The tetrachord, for all its clever dispositions, its rising and falling, its varieties of rhythmic groupings, its inversions and leaps from voice to voice, are simply the material with which he works. This completes the second great trajectory. Beethoven now makes doubly solid the point which he has already twice affirmed, that the fragment must be made whole, which is the essence of his form. He makes sure by giving us a complete A major scale rising steadily over five octaves against a new figure which reflects the rhythm of the opening rocket. You might call this the confirmation ceremony, a process that confirms you in the key of A major, the dominant. A new figure now quietly says Amen to all this in half notes. Its outline has a curious resemblance to the full chords at the last great climax. Perhaps Beethoven didn't think of that consciously, but such are the ways of a great musical architect with a fantastic intuitive sense of unity. The last gesture of the tetrachord in this exposition is to hold a quiet conversation between bass and soprano. 
The soprano has to adjust itself to the new key by altering its first note. A mystifying transformation now takes place in anticipation of the next great leap, the development. The tetrachord changes its meaning by lowering its second note a half step. That note is no longer a leading tone, so we have lost track of A major. Even more waywardly, it next alters its third tone, becoming like a fragment of a Phrygian scale. All this furtive creeping leads to an explosion of the rocket in D minor. A rather ambiguous appearance of the tetrachord lies in the last notes of the rocket followed by the surprising B-flat chord after the fermata. They form the tetrachord in the key of B-flat. Beethoven must have enjoyed that little joke as he seems to enjoy everything else in this sonata. With the startling modulation to B-flat major, we are out in the open for the development and swing along with exhilaration in the long stride of the opening rocket. The modulations carry us from B-flat to E-flat, a long way from home, giving us a sense of distance and wide perspective. Beethoven avoids any danger of monotony from the motivic repetition by giving his two new ideas a new and interesting rhythm, totally unrelated to any previous configuration. And later... Notice to what exciting and dramatic use he puts those two leaping tones as he approaches the fermata closing the development. Upside down and rhythmically displaced, they jog us out of the pattern and propel us headlong to the dominant seventh chord. In the recapitulation, one ought to enjoy to the full the tremendous and power-generating shift of gears that takes place when that first full orchestra outburst at the opening of the movement recurs. Instead of the equable balancing of tonic, supertonic, and dominant, we are thrown off balance by the command in the bass rising chromatically in an imperious way to C-sharp, where it drops to B, the dominant, of two, where the new tune is to settle. Meanwhile, the tetrachord has had to give way with a chromatic cry on top of this powerful shift. We came a long way in those few bars. Toward the end of the movement, a powerful extension of the Amen figure from the end of the exposition propels us toward the subdominant area. This sets up the coda, where we once again hear that conversation between the bass and soprano with the altered tetrachord. But where earlier the figure had evaporated over three octaves into a silent bar,
It now continues to send its streamers up from the base, each time undergoing a mysterious contraction of its intervals. The addition of a B-flat in the bass makes of its last contraction a dominant seventh chord, which turns enharmonically into a German sixth, leading us right to the dominant of D major and home. With those upbeat Sforzandi again demarcating its contracting rhythmic units, it marches with determination to a final resolution. These last 28 bars are an answer to that remarkable phrase from the exposition of which I spoke earlier. Equally skillful, it is perhaps the more remarkable as form and expression in that those same techniques of rhythmic and harmonic diminution, aided by the willful sforzandi, are employed to steer us not onward and outward, but homeward. Its excitement is more like the recognition of a long-lost familiar place than the discovery of a new one. Its descending line, too, corroborates this impression. The last 18 bars restore to us a sense of balance and completion which no other treatment could give in such a dramatically exciting piece. The bass murmurs continuously on a tonic pedal, while the tetrachord is made into a whole scale by the two upper voices. The moving parts, which include an augmentation of the tetrachord in the bass. Can have nothing other than the effect of tangential activity and the great crescendo of the last 12 bars can be perceived only as a final burst, a last hurrah. Does one really need to know all this about a tetrachord and its action in order to interpret the sonata? Yes, must be the answer, but much more. The important thing is to see how Beethoven builds with these tiny units and to what purposes. For that, one must see all the elements as working together in total interdependence to shape the whole. When the performer tries to realize all their implications in performance, some part of Beethoven's creative will will have become his own and he may then become a faithful servant of the music. The second movement, Largo e Mesto, is surely one of Beethoven's greatest tragic expressions. It is not contemplative, as are so many of the composer's slow movements, but it is full of deep personal pain and despair, an almost palpable anguish. Think of the painful way in which the melody, that melody which arises out of the semitone at the beginning of the work, struggles to emerge from the dark mass of the harmony. One thinks of Michelangelo's Prigione, that marvelous late sculpture, in which the figures struggle to emerge from the stone. They are not in bold relief, but very shadowy. So it is here with the melody, which seems to be pulled back constantly into the mass of the harmony with that sad C-sharp D.
The performer should think, too, of the emotional and textural contrast between the first and second ideas. The first anguished and struggling, seeming to be welded to the harmony, the second clearer and more classical in its features. The second idea, unlike the first, does stand in bold relief against a transparent Alberti bass. It is more declamatory in its rhythm and more decorative in its structure. As this idea continues, it seems to be struggling toward the light. Consider, for example, what happens when its second phrase turns toward C major. The whole cut of the ensuing phrase becomes more confident and forward-looking, with rising rather than falling melodic curves. The whole of this large first paragraph, indeed, must be thought of as a gradual emergence from darkness into light, and the tone and the management of the texture should express that. But the light thus achieved is to be denied. The ensuing phrases declaim haltingly, though nobly, of despair and futility. The cadences bespeak an empty hopelessness. There is a wonderful moment of solace in the F major episode. But it is only temporary, for the mood of dark pain returns with the diminished chord. The broken figure above the steadily pulsing harmony in the bass symbolizes the exterior aspects of suffering, wailing and sighing. Beethoven was well aware of the problem of reconciling such a dark and grief-laden expression with the light and joy of the rest of the work. Unity within movements is one thing to achieve, and Beethoven does that so supremely well, but real psychological connections between radically different moods and structures is another problem. Beethoven solves this problem by allowing the slow movement to dissolve, as it were, into thin air with that initial semitone.
one can imagine those shadowy figures of Michelangelo disappearing again into the stone. With this ending, the beginning of the happy menuet seems less like an intrusion upon a private grief than like a solacing ray of light. In interpreting this piece, it is important to realize that extreme slowness is not synonymous with tragic emotion. Some of Beethoven's most serene music requires far slower tempo. The movement is marked largo e mesto, largo meaning literally broad, mesto, sad, mournful. The breadth or slowness is already in the movement of the harmony. The meter is 6-8, a meter which was traditionally used in the 18th century for a two-in-the-bar pulsation. The slowness of the harmony is what gives weight to the movement. Then, too, the more declamatory passages will not approximate the natural speed of very solemn speech which I take to be a desirable aim, if played at too slow a tempo. The pure light of the Allegro minuet should begin on a very quietly intoned upbeat A, so as not to unduly disturb the hush of the Largo's close. Its serene line should float with the most beautiful legato, unaccented until the 6-4 chord at the cadence. The second strain brings the first hint of jocularity and energy. This seems more peasant than aristocrat, and that is borne out fully in the lender-like trio, which is pure bucolic bounce. Notice how Beethoven refrains from tying the upbeat to the downbeat in the codetta of the first section. This is a subtle unification device, a way of anticipating the more detached character of the trio. If you want to look for a tetrachord connection, you can find that here, too, at the beginning of the movement. Notice how, at the end of the phrase, this tetrachord sets off a touch of Beethoven's rude but good-natured humor at the cadence. The four bars ending the phrase outline the tetrachord A, G, F sharp, E. That same tetrachord, in diminution, rudely interrupts the resolution to the dominant, pushing in on the offbeat. Considering Beethoven's unifying devices as between movements, we discover an interesting one between the end of this menuet and the rondo finale. In the final cadence of the menuet, the tenor and alto move upward and downward, respectively, to the resolution. The two tones of resolution then begin the rondo as a quick upbeat. The fun of it, beside the connection, is that the rondo tune pulls you immediately back to the subdominant after the last twelve bars of the menuet have insisted repeatedly on the dominant tonic cadence formula to plant you firmly in D.
To realize this fun, you can't wait too long before beginning the finale. The listener might not remember what he last heard, and that is essential to the appreciation of the wit. The rondo theme, with its cuckoo clock humor of sudden appearance and equally sudden disappearance, should be delivered with an acuteness of timing that will make the listener wonder, what time does the next cuckoo leave? The answer to this simple-minded motive, this inverted cuckoo with the upbeat tail, is mocking, like gathering oneself up into an exaggerated and florid pose. Just as in the first movement of the sonata, one might make a game of finding the tetrachord, here, one must look carefully at all the tricks played with the cuckoo motive at each recurrence of the rondo theme. It imitates itself. It chases itself. It separates itself from its own base and plays tag with it. It connects up with its own bass and forms a canon at the octave with itself. Elsewhere, it is weary, wary, questioning, explosive, mocking by turns. Finally, it settles down after all this appearance and disappearance with no intention of doing anything more, it is all in the base now, and slips quietly around the corner and vanishes. Thinking of the mercurial changes of mood within this rondo as humorous in intent, one discovers the importance of timing and subtle changes of pace. The performer should not accept anything that is merely exact, even though exactness must be his first achievement. This is a rondo with no hummable tune. All is action with tiny motives, and the player should not only make his audience smile inwardly, it would be even more rewarding should they laugh outright. After all, it's in the script. But you have to be a good actor for comedy. <laughs> 